Welcome to the SEC Breakdown. As lots to get to this week. Let's hop right into it. That's conference championship weekend, of course, but uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Off the top, I want to talk about the, the coaching carousel. Auburn has an opening. Vanderbilt has closed. Vanderbilt uh, hires Clark Lee away from Notre Dame, Notre Dame's defensive coordinator. And then uh, Sunday, Auburn makes a move. Gus Malzahn, who was never able to put much separation between himself and the hot seat in his eight-year tenure, is out despite never having a losing season at Auburn. Josh, surprised to see the Malzahn era end after this 6-4 and four season or, or no? Not surprised they wanted it to happen. I'm surprised they finally all got on the same page, the powers that be, and made the move. Um, I think this was kind of coming for a couple of years. Um, they, Auburn wants more. I don't know if Auburn can get more. With, I don't know if a new coach will get them more, but they don't want six and four. They don't want eight and five. They don't want nine and three. They want to be where Alabama is, where LSU was last year, where Georgia is headed. That's where they want to be. And that they haven't got there yet. And they're sick of, they were kind of sick of not being able to get there with Malzahn. I think it was a case of just looking at it and seeing, hey, we don't see this guy ever getting us there like he did in 2013. It's been seven years since then. It's not going to happen. So they committed to, to $21.5 million in buyout money to, to make the change now, which is so, I mean, I, I think Gus is a good coach. Um, he's getting paid like a great coach. Uh, he just wasn't quite good enough for what Auburn wants right now, and that's why they, they ultimately made the move. It's interesting because whenever there's a, a coaching change, I always wonder, uh, you know, okay, is, is the guy that they replace – going to do, you know, going to have a better record than, than the guy that left. And of course uh, you got to wait a few years to, to find that out. But Malzahn in particular, I mean, never, like I said, never had a, a losing season. Uh, won what close to about two thirds of his games uh, over the course of, of his eight seasons. Uh, Brett, Zach, do you, do you think, um, you know, do you think whoever Auburn hires will wind up, elevating Auburn to the, the stage that they want? Or uh, will we look back on, on Mal, the Malzahn era and, and say that they uh, wound up downgrading? Seems like kind of a, a small window to hit, right? I, I, I cannot tell you how many times I've cited Josh's Twitter thread that he had after the Iron Bowl loss where he kind of put Gus Malzahn up against some of the better coaches in Auburn history, like Pat Dye, the one they named the field after. That probably says something. And it's somewhat comparable, right? Like in terms of the highs and the lows, the peaks and the valleys, Gus Malzahn is somewhat comparable to to some of Auburn's best coaches. And Josh could probably remember the numbers off the top of his head or or somewhat close to them. So he could probably speak to it better than than I could. But the point of that is that Auburn is, is letting go of a coach that did about as much as some of the better coaches they've had in school history. Now, obviously Auburn's in a better spot now than they have been prior because there's a cash just revolution in the SEC and college football as a whole. And and they probably have more access to talent than they have in, in previous eras since the population has been kind of moving towards Georgia and Texas, places that, that Auburn can generally recruit relatively well. So there, there's possibility for upward mobility. I'm not, I'm not saying they can't be better than what they currently are, but it's it's a very small window of opportunity to be better than what they are right now, but it's a huge window of opportunity to be worse than they are. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think as Josh kind of alluded to, I mean, I'm, I always expected them to make the move. I'm just surprised they did it during a pandemic. Um, you know, I knew we all knew that some coaching uh, firings were going to happen, but for this of all the years to be the year that Auburn moves on from Gus Malzahn, I mean, uh, especially coming off of a win too. But I am surprised that they hung on to him when it seemed like they were dissatisfied with the results for so long when they moved on from Gene Chizik after a national uh, championship the way that they did. So, uh, I mean, they they clearly are, you know, are going to move on from a coach regardless of the results if they're not happy with where the program is at. And maybe they – kept Malzahn a little bit too long. Um, but at the end of the day, 
as as Brett said, you know, what is the goal? I mean, obviously you want to get to where uh, Gene Chizik got the program, but that's also a coach that you got rid of after uh, when he went through one of those peaks and valleys. And that's going to happen with pretty much every uh, coach that comes through that program if you look at history. So they're going to have to get someone there that uh, – I think maybe that could help that as kind of we saw the, the move that Vanderbilt made, someone that has a little bit of a background with Auburn, um, you know, more ties to the SEC maybe than Malzahn did, um, but, but maybe someone that is a little bit more entrenched in the program uh, and can satisfy the fan base in that way. Malzahn owed a buyout of $21.45 million, so quite a payday to, to go away. Josh, um, you know, obviously all attention now shifts toward who's next. And, you know, I think the name right off the top that people will be wondering about is, is Hugh Freeze. Um, but tell us a little bit about the search. And I, I know you did a, a hot board, but some, some names to monitor uh, here as this unfolds. Yeah, Hugh Freeze was the, the first name thrown around by every national writer. But everything I've heard from Auburn is that he's not a candidate at all. Um, Auburn's not considering him, just um, – the national writers are because I guess his agent told him to. Um, but uh, it, it seems like the, the two names at the top of the board right now are, are Kevin Steele and Mario Cristobal. Uh, Kevin Steele, obviously the defensive coordinator at Auburn under Gus Malzahn for the last five years and Mario Cristobal at Oregon. Um, uh, Kevin Steele seems like a favorite right now. It's interesting to, to pay that much money to get rid of Malzahn and hire a guy who was down the hall. Um, but Kevin Steele has a lot of support in that building in Auburn. Um, and then Mario Cristobal, another save and assistant. I guess if you can't beat him consistently, you can beat him three times, but not that many more. Um, try to join them. Cristobal's a great recruiter, uh, has experience in the SEC. He's from the Southeast, would be a good fit. Um, but he might be trying to work this opening into more money at Oregon. You don't, you don't really know what coaches are thinking until they actually, you know, come out and make the move at the end of the day. So, those are the two names right now, but uh, this thing could evolve. We'll see how it goes from here. Yeah, because saving assistants have worked so well for, for everyone else. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect recipe. Can, can, can I ask y'all a question? Would, would y'all leave Oregon for Auburn? I, I don't think I would because the path to the playoff at Oregon is somewhat clean, right? You win the Pac-12, you're probably going to be there. Uh, or at least, I mean, recent history Have would, a shot, too. Yeah, recent history would, would disagree, but – that's more on the Pac-12 than it is the the individual champions, right? Like, if you win the Pac-12, you've got a good chance of being there. Auburn's path to the playoff is loaded with landmines. Like, the best versions of Auburn still will miss the playoff more times than not, right? I mean, that's what Gus Malzahn's tenure was. The best versions of Auburn will still miss the playoff because their path there is so just landmine-laden, whereas at Oregon – they're recruiting at a higher level. They're starting to get their operation where it needs to be to the point that they could project themselves to be a Pac-12 power in the somewhat near future. If you're dominating that conference, you got a good chance of being in the playoff. It, it's hard to dominate this conference. Even if you're as good as Alabama is, they don't necessarily dominate this conference by any stretch of the imagination. So I would, I don't know that I would leave Oregon for, for Auburn from that perspective. Now, I've, I've never been put in a position to turn down a $6 million salary. So I think that's the key. I mean, Mario Cristobal makes $2.7 million at, at Oregon. So Auburn could give him about 4 million reasons uh, to leave Oregon and, and come to Auburn. I mean, they were paying uh, Malzahn, what, $7 million a year, and they didn't even like him that much. So <laughs> Yeah, I'll be curious to see if Oregon ponies up uh, to keep Cristobal. Um because I think it's, it's not even just it's not even just the path to playoff at Auburn. It's is Auburn going to spend the money on football to compete with those big schools? Because Auburn wants to be with Alabama, with Georgia, with Florida, with LSU. All those schools spend so much more money on football. They have better facilities than Auburn. Um, they spend more on recruiting. Auburn's not there yet. So I think whoever the new coach is has to come in and say, "All right, I'm interested in this job, but I need you to start spending money on the program like these other schools do." Um, cause this is an arm race, this sport, you can't just be like, Oh, we'll, we'll try on the field. And if we don't do it, like whatever, you got to spend money off the field to win on the field. Um, Auburn, a new coach might fix some things, but it wouldn't fix that part of it. That's got to come from the money people. How do you feel like the fan base uh, would react to them ending up with steel? 
because uh, obviously it did. I mean, if you go with an assistant, it did work out for LSU. I feel like initially it probably wouldn't be super positive. It's not really a, a buzzy hire, and fans love buzz. Um, sure. I think could, the I think recruits it, would like it. The recruits like it. I mean, players love Kevin Steele. Um, he's a good coach. He's a good recruiter. Um, but he's not a um, a movie that would be celebrated, you know, nationally. It'd be more like sure. uh, really they they fired the head coach to hire his DC. But it it could work. Um, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be an exciting move off the bat. No, hiring a, a guy that won two thirds of his games in eight years to replace him with a guy who won twenty percent of his games <laughs> to Baylor uh, would be fascinating. Now, granted, there are examples of coaches that do better their their second time around for, for sure uh but it yeah it would be an interesting sell i think pivoting uh most interesting development on the field last weekend happened in the fog lsu upset of florida aided by a marco wilson shoe throw it was a hard time for for those guys to, to handle how that went down there on the, on the shoe throw zach what did you think i mean was it pretty clear-cut penalty and and just uh how, how bizarre of a situation was that not if you talk to dan mullen if you saw the comments uh on the sec uh, championship game teleconference he but I won't say he stood up for marco because he acknowledged the wrongdoing but uh he basically argued and and it's hard to argue against this part of it uh that it was a football play that he made which it was um you know uh taylor tried to jump over marco as he was making a diving tackle attempt he grabs him by the left foot and as he brings him down his shoe comes off so it wasn't like he you know intentionally ripped it off but instead of you know just dropping it or handing it back to taylor he stood up took two steps and hurled it 25 yards and, you know, that's where he made the mistake. Mullen tried to argue that he made a big third down play. There's two minutes left in the game. He's pumped up. It's senior night. He's never – I mean, he didn't say this, but, he, but he's like he's got the shoe in his hand and he just throws it. He was like he wasn't trying to – he didn't throw it at the sideline or at anybody. He wasn't trying to taunt them. Uh, he, he was like he wasn't trying to disrespect the game. He was trying to make an argument that basically it shouldn't have been an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, which I don't think anybody can argue against that. But uh, point being is he came to his defense of his player, which I thought was pretty interesting because nobody's really doing that. Um outside of maybe some of his teammates and, and obviously his, uh, you know, his supporting cast. But uh, that was a play that's and a mistake that is going to go down in Florida football history. I mean, you are never going to hear the end of that. I mean, you're going to remember that play and that uh, mistake, just like you remember the Dallas Baker curse from 2004 at Tennessee when he slapped the guy's helmet and allowed uh, Tennessee to go kick the game winning field goals, very similar to that. Um, so at the end of the day, Ford has got to pick the pieces back up and uh, try and go play in Atlanta. But, man, what a terrible way to end your season and against a team that was uh, as, as vulnerable as it had been, honestly, in this rivalry's history. Brings us to the, the, the playoff outlook. Uh, we'll talk about the SEC championship here in a moment. But um, playoff picture, Alabama, let's, let's run through the, the three teams – Alabama, Texas A&M finishing up here against Tennessee. Of course, A&M won't be playing in the SEC championship, but does have a win over over Florida. Uh, lone loss to Alabama. So, Alabama, are they in even with a loss to Florida? A&M, how realistic is their avenue in? And Florida, even with a win over Alabama, is there is there any path into the playoff for them? And I know – I know part of this depends on on what's happening elsewhere, but um, you know what do you what do you guys think on on the path forward for for those three teams? For Alabama's purposes, it largely depends on what happens in the ACC title game. A- Alabama would greatly benefit from Notre Dame beating Clemson and effectively knocking Clemson out of consideration for for the playoff, because then you have three spots available where if Alabama does lose to Florida. You're, you've got three spots for four teams with Bama, Texas A&M, SEC champ Florida at that point, and then Ohio State, right? And like maybe the committee considers Cincinnati. I doubt it based on their recent history. 
Um, maybe Iowa State gets some consideration, but I, I don't anticipate that being the case. So your your odds are pretty good if Notre Dame beats Clemson. If Clemson beats Notre Dame and, and the playoff does what I think they would do, which is put both of those teams in the in the playoff, then you're down to two spots for, for four teams. And assuming Ohio State wins, they'll probably stay in. So then you're kind of in a hairy situation with one – playoff spot for three SEC teams and you just lost the head to head to one of them. And one of them has the, the conference title. So uh, let's be real. Alabama has benefited from the college football playoff selection committee's uh, kindness in, in recent years. So even if Bama loses to Florida, I think most people would project them into the playoff and I don't think they'd be wrong to do so. Um, it would just make it a lot easier for Bama to get in if they lose to Florida, if, Notre Dame also beats Clemson again and, and effectively knocks Clemson out of the playoff. The committee has got to be rooting pretty hard for Alabama because that would make their life easier. If just if it, that just happens, like it, everyone thinks it will, and just because if, if Bama loses and then maybe Clemson beats Notre Dame, now you've got like what do we do at this point? Who's number one if if that happens? Um, so that that just complicates everything. So if if Bama wins, the committee can say, all right, we've got we got a number one. AC championship, ACC champions number two, figured out from there. Um, Florida, it's hard to see that working unless they beat Alabama convincingly, yep. um, which I I can't really see after last week. Uh, Texas A&M, regardless of what they do, I, I can't. It's hard to see them slipping in. I think the thing they're rooting for is Notre Dame to beat Clemson because that would not Clemson out and that would open up a second spot. But best case, you're putting them back in at number four. Does anyone want to see them play Alabama again? No. I don't know. So, yeah, I I feel like the SEC is good enough that it has three teams in the conversation right now. But at the end of the day, it's probably going to end up with one playoff team. It's probably going to be Alabama. I would agree with that. And I I think that even if, uh, you know, Florida were somehow to uh, upset Alabama, I don't know if uh, A&M would would get in. and if anything, you know, you'd have Dan Mullen campaigning for Florida. I agree with you, though, Josh. They they would have to have like a Clemson-like victory over Alabama, and Alabama just have to have everything go wrong in that game. Um, and, you know, I, and I will say, Florida having Kyle Pitts back, they'll they'll be able to at least keep up with Alabama, maybe for a time. Uh, but their defense, uh, whatever progress they had made toward the end of the season. Um, it, it, they, they totally got rid of it uh, after their performance against LSU with a true freshman quarterback coming into the swamp with his first career start and putting up on that type of performance. Um, now Florida looks like the vulnerable team coming into this game. So I, I think for the committee's sake, if Alabama can take care of Florida and uh, you know uh, Notre Dame can beat uh, – Clemson, that would make life easier for them. If Clemson gets the win, uh, that might complicate things a little bit. But uh, Ohio State obviously got saved by, by the Big Ten. And if they win, they should be in. All right, let's get on to the picks. Four games this week. We're going to breeze through the, the first couple, Texas A&M at Tennessee. Probably all like a- A&M there, right? Keep rolling. Missouri and uh, Mississippi State, not a ton of intrigue there. Let's get a pick on, on Ole Miss LSU. Anybody in, inspired enough by LSU's win over Florida to take the Tigers? Uh, I'm, I'm going to take Ole Miss, but what do you guys think? I think LSU burned off its, its big game against Florida. That was the big one. They, they played up for it. They got their big win in the Swamp, and I think this week they kind of come crashing back to what LSU has been this season and Ole Miss wins. I'll take Ole Miss. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I'll take Ole Miss. Sure. I like Ole Miss, too. I just uh, – I, I feel like uh, – LSU, although they played a great game, they they got some fortune on their side. They got the fog, you know. They got a bunch of weird bounce, balls bounce their way against the Gators, and and uh, I think that their luck kind of runs out. And Ole Miss is going to come out firing in Baton Rouge. And it leaves us with the the conference championship. Would have been a little bit spicier had Florida not lost last week, but nonetheless, Alabama against. Florida, I, I like Alabama by a few touchdowns. I think, you know, Florida is the one team that has the offense to keep up with them. Best team since since Ole Miss in terms of maybe the, the team poised to keep up with them. Ultimately, I still like Alabama for uh, with, by a few touchdowns. Uh, what do you guys think? And, and you know, what's 
What's the way that that Florida can get an upset in in this game? I think Florida, I think they'll end up probably scoring in the 30s, um, but they'll probably need to score in the 40s or maybe even 50s to win this game. Um, Because I I just, I think it's going to be a shootout. I don't think that their defense, uh, although I think they could get some stops, I think Alabama will have to shoot themselves in the foot uh, and help Florida with some mistakes of their own and, and, and a rare Mac Jones turnover or, or just some, you know, potentially blown coverages on defense if Florida can throw some stuff at them that uh, confuses them. And Dan Mullen's a great uh, play design and play caller. So, but it, yeah, I mean, I, after the way that they played against LSU and I know that they didn't have Kyle Pitts and that will make a difference. Um, I just think that them scoring in the 40s, uh, they're not going to be – or excuse me, them scoring in the 30s, they're not going to be able to keep Alabama in the 30s. They're going to be able to score on this Florida defense more than anybody else has this season. And as good as and prolific as Florida is offensively, uh, they're not going to be able to keep up. Florida's defensive style, it's a Todd Grantham defense. We, we know what it is. It's very aggressive. It's very blitzing, uh, emotional blitzing, if you will. And – this is a team, this is an Alabama team that can, is equipped to deal with that. They have what I believe is the best offensive line in the country. They were just named a semifinalist for the Joe Moore Award, one of 11. So they're probably a top 10 offensive line in the nation. And now you're dealing with a quarterback in Mac Jones who is intelligent. Like he's been forced to take checkdowns at times this year, and he's taken them when they've been the option. So they have all the tools to deal with a defense that – is aggressive like this, thus I think they're well poised to take advantage of it and put those 40 to 50 points on the board that they're going to need to outpace Florida. So I think it's going to be Bama in this one. I think this game will be a shootout definitely to start. Uh, I hope it's a shootout to start because as a fan just watching from home, I want this to be a high-scoring game. But I think you'll see it maybe go back and forth for a while, but I think eventually Alabama just proves too much, especially if Florida can't stop them. Um, Florida have to play a perfect game on offense. That's hard to do against Alabama. I think eventually Alabama just pulls away. It's a high-scoring game, but Alabama still wins by double digits. Zach, Brett, enjoy covering the SEC championship. Josh, enjoy covering a, a coaching search as much as one can. And uh, I'll see whether uh, I'll be covering a coaching search at Tennessee in about a week or so. So thanks for watching the SEC Breakdown.